Hello, welcome to Never Stop, the artistry of self-care and creativity for lifelong embodied performance. This is the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit, and I'm Cynthia Allen. I'm very pleased to be introducing you today to Dr. Roberta Gary, a professor emerita at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, where she taught for 46 years. She has performed throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe, and has recorded the music of Frank Liszt, Brodke, and Johann Sebastian Bach. With her husband, Tom Miles, she has presented workshops on body mapping and on the topic of what every organist needs to know about the body. She has many influences that have happened here over her life, and she's gonna be sharing some of those with us, but it will also certainly include a little bit about the Alexander Technique and the Feldenkrais Method. Hi, Roberta. Hi, Cynthia. It's really good to be with you here in your own home. That's right. I'm glad that you could come here because uh, I think it's a good place to be. And since I'm going to play some harpsichord music for you later uh, that everyone can enjoy. Absolutely. And I, I remember, Roberta, the very first time I met you, uh, you you showed up out of nowhere in, in so a workshop. Speak. Yes, <laughs> you, and, you and Tom climbed a... a along to stories and oh, that, forgotten that Masonic Lodge, that was, yes. yes, and came to a walking workshop. That's right. And we did it because we saw uh, something in the newspaper about announcing this workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just thought, you know, you can read something and say, this might be for us. And uh, it was. Yeah, and I, I mean, because of you, I continue to put things in the newspaper. I'm not sure anyone else ever showed up, ever. <laughs> well, you don't know that. Maybe they didn't tell you that they saw it in the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah, but we did tell you that. Yes, and that was probably around uh, 20 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. It was. Think? It was a little over 20 years ago, yes. And then we started to work together for a number of years privately and um, in, enjoyed that immensely. And I uh, learned as much from you as I, as I hope you learned from me. I, your topic of your talk here today, our in the interview, is still teaching, still learning. And I always yeah. felt like a session with you was me teaching and learning, or learning and teaching. I couldn't ever tell the difference between what was happening. Well, your point is good there because uh, I, I can't tell the difference a lot of times either. In fact, I always say that my main student is me, uh, so teaching is of oneself as well, and sometimes the line is, is hard to find where mm -hmm. that is. But I must say that I am delighted that you asked to interview me, and, and the benefit for me was that it forced me to look back at my life. When I'm almost 89, and it's all I can do to keep up with everything, it seems like, and when I went back, tried to go back to the beginning, uh, it was quite interesting to me to find, to try to figure out who I was uh, at the very beginning. And um, in fact, I was reminded of a quote, which I'm gonna check to make sure I have it right here, uh, that I've always used in teaching and to students is from Kierkegaard, and it is, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Mm. So, I realized that I hadn't always taken the time to look backwards at it, and in the preparation here, I've gotten to do that, and I've, I've come up with more memories than would have ordinarily come to my mind because I let it simmer in my brain overnight. So mm. thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. I think it's good to have a little reason for a review like that. Yeah. And you... You started with your love of music, it seems like, very young, very young. Yes, my mother played the piano by ear. And um, I remember her playing, let's see, her favorite song was Let the Rest of the World Go By. And you probably don't know that, you're not old enough to know that. But is it some, go to some little place in the West and da da da, and let the rest of the world go by. And she would just sing along, playing that. And can I have piano lessons, Mother? And she said, well, yes, the woman down the street teaches piano. Her name is Christine. It's Christine Schweitzer. I bet she would take you, even though you're only uh, six years old, we'll see if she would take you as a student. So she did. And uh, 
I started learning in the John M. Williams book, which is one piece for every key. Uh, start in C major, then add one sharp, or add one flat, and so on. You learn these little pieces. And I kind of looked at it at the, that time, I think, as a, as a game, um, like learning to read. I wanted to learn to read, and I wasn't in school yet. And the children next door were trying to teach me how to read. And I could read A, and the, uh, her, his, and so on. I just thought it was fascinating. So it didn't start really as a love of music, but as a love of another skill that was offered in the world. Mm. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and, it, and it's own kind of language. Yeah, right. It's a different language, right. I hadn't really made that connection, of course, as a kid. Uh, but nowadays, uh, Tom used to teach Suzuki piano, and uh, you may know that Suzuki students don't start by reading music. They, they do things by listening and by finger patterns. And the advantage to that, and I wish they had had that at the time, was that they are taught a good hand position from the beginning, instead of having to struggle to read the notes and maybe get tense, and the teacher thinks it's just okay whatever they do with hand position as long as they get the notes right. So that's, of course, totally against what you or I would think now. Uh, you want the, the person to do it the right, the right way or one of the right ways with ease in the playing and not with tension. So Suzuki piano would be good uh, all the time. Uh, I don't know if I had a bad hand position or not because it took me years to really get rid of tension in my playing. I do know that. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I went to school, learning to read was something like learning music to me. Again, it was, it was a game, a skill, a something to, to help you be a grown-up, right? Mm -hmm. So that you could make your way in the world. I don't know that I thought of it exactly like that. Yeah, and I, I think that um, one of the things that interests me is how that connection for you that you made fairly early in skill acquisition around music mm -hmm. uh, turned out to be such a major motivator when you had this unexpected event that was happening all across mm -hmm. the U.S., uh, probably our... our uh, in, in your lifetime, I suppose it was the pandemic. Right. I think it, it was just really beginning in 1939. Uh, I was seven years old. I mean, I don't remember the very beginning of it. All I remember is that one day I couldn't get out of bed, and um, my mother called a doctor, and the doctors made house calls then. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came over and uh, tried to get me out of bed, and I couldn't stand up. Uh, so, well, I think, I don't think it's polio, he said. I think it's rheumatic fever. So, and so they didn't put me in an iron lung or anything. So probably a good thing mm -hmm. that he got that wrong. And what I had was a very mild case of polio. Uh, I was maybe in bed for three months at the most, I would say, um, before I could get up and start to walk with a, or be in a wheelchair and be helped. Um, and try to learn to walk again. Um, I was in the second grade at the time, which reminded me when I was looking back for this interview that the first teacher, who was not a musician, but a teacher, was my second grade teacher who, not because she had to, but because she wanted to, came to visit me at home once or twice a week while I was in bed and brought the lessons for me to work on because she didn't want me to fall behind in mm. reading. Her name was Nellie Fulweiler. I don't remember most of my teacher's names from grade school, but I did remember hers. And uh, so I didn't uh, fall back in grade school and pretty soon I could get up and kind of walk. And my mother reminds me that the first thing I wanted to do when I could come downstairs, my bedroom was upstairs, uh, was to get on the piano bench and uh, try to play again where I had been practicing in the book before. So I guess they thought I should be a musician. 
<laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it does sort of seem like maybe that they were right. I don't know. It does look that way. Yeah. Uh, so I did keep taking lessons with the woman down the street until I got through several of the John and Williams books, and then she said that was as far as she had ever gotten. So she recommended another teacher in the town, Rosalind Wilson. And uh, the good thing about that was that Rosalind, oh, I called her Miss Wilson, of course. Miss Wilson uh, knew some people in Cincinnati, uh, which was going to become important later when she suggested that I should start taking lessons down here from somebody. So uh, it was starting to look like I thought, and she thought, and maybe my parents thought, that I should be a musician. Mm -hmm. And did you find that um, in those years, did you find that as a, as a pianist at that time, or the, the hoped would be hoped pianist, to be, yeah. hoped to be would be pianist, that you were already needing to spend quite a bit of time on how you used your body as a result either of tension and or polio? Uh, not as much as you might think, uh, because it didn't affect my arms, and uh, what it did affect is, I mean, you use your right foot on the, the damper pedal, and uh, that was hard for me to do, but because I was still short, I could kind of push it down from above. Uh, it did, that did bother me later, uh, when I was full grown and was already a piano major, it, I couldn't really manipulate the damper pedal as well as I sh should have been able to. And I'm sure that that put some tension in the rest of my body while I was trying to do that. Uh, until I got to the College of Music, though, uh, no piano teacher uh, had ever approached what we might think of as a somatic approach uh, to playing. It was, it was always pretty much oh, try to relax, or, uh, uh, you know, play these notes any way you can, and uh, they weren't really into that. They wanted you to get the right notes at the right tempo, and uh, uh, more of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you did start to see a shift already in college, um, the university? I, I the... did, at college. Uh -huh. uh, I was lucky in that sense. Uh, and having known now a lot of piano teachers uh, just from observing their students later. Not every piano teacher at the college level has a real awareness of how the body uh, should be used. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have a particular technique in mind. Oh yes, I studied the something technique. Uh, I said, my teacher said, do it this way, and so on. I was fortunate at the College of Music where I went after graduating from high school and so I would have been about I would have been 16 going in there uh, to have Madame Olga Konis as my teacher and she was a Russian lady uh, who with her husband who was already deceased had escaped from Russia at the revolution and had gone to Paris where they helped to found the Russian conservatory in Paris so-called and she had been a friend of Rachmaninoff and uh, Nicholas Metner and Scriabin, other well-known pianists and composers in Russia. And her husband had developed a book of, less, of, uh, of exercises, unlike most exercises, which simply take a, um, a technique study, like a trill or or a series of chords, and you repeat them a long time, and faster and faster and faster. Uh, his exercises, which she had, they weren't in print but at the time, she, we all had to copy them into our manuscript books, and they would start with how to play one note. Even though we were playing difficult pieces, you learned now how to drop your hand with, with the weight of your arm, how to be thinking something about more than just your hand and fingers. And she got as far as the shoulder, maybe, that's about it. Uh, but it wasn't just the fingers anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it helped, it, right away, your wrist could release tension. And she had a saying that she said, 
uh, I'll try the accent, but it won't work. To, uh, I will break your wrist, but then I will fix it. Uh, so what she meant was, your wrist is too tight. <laughs> I'm going to make you get rid of the tension. You won't be able to play, but then I'm going to fix it. And you will be able to play, and it won't be tense. Right? Mm -hmm. And she did. Mm -hmm. Both of those. She broke and it. big gifts. She broke it, and she fixed it. <laughs> So that was good. So that was the beginning of seeing, I think, that it didn't have to hurt, right? And I hadn't thought of it that way. But uh, that you could play and it, it uh, could be enjoyable physically as well. Mm -hmm. It also was the beginning of let's expand our consciousness away from the keyboard. Uh, let's not just only be thinking of here down, or the fingers down, or the wrist down, or the elbow down. Can we be thinking of more than that? Mm -hmm. But it, the rest of it usually only went to sit up straighter. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you were into the piano through those years with her, and is she the is she the one who uh, in, turned you on to organ or? Uh... Ah, no. In fact, well, <laughs> she was not, but. As this is, is really was lucky for me. The school required that piano majors had to take organ as their secondary study. And I am not quite sure why they did that, except to give work to the organ teacher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, but I, I thought it was a good idea because I knew that uh, I probably could learn the organ fast enough enough of it that I could get a church job. And church jobs right then, back in those days, were paying $15 a week. And I didn't have any, I had hardly any allowance from my parents. And uh, the $15 a week I could use to buy recordings of piano music, see? And sure enough, I had been studying organ about a year and I got a church job in some little town across the river. And I would take, I don't know, no, nobody had cars then, Kids didn't have cars, students. But you could go downtown on the trolley and then get on the on the bus that went across the river on Sunday morning out to, I think it was Bromley, and play on an electronic organ uh, for the Sunday church service and get your $15. Mm -hmm. And what kind of electronic organ? It was so, electronic. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was, of course it was awful. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't know that. I hardly knew that myself. <laughs> <laughs> And the pipe organs that we had at, at the College of Music were also, as I look back, uh, we would be laughing at them now, but we'd be laughing at a lot of things that were done in the past, and they'd probably be laughing at us at some of the things that we're doing. Uh, so my, my piano teacher was not against this idea. She thought that was okay, as long as it didn't get in the way of my piano practice. But as you know, uh, I got more and more interested in the organ, and because I had a good piano technique, even though I, my right leg couldn't do what it was supposed to do, so organists play the pedals with the toes or the heels. So they have four different services they can play from. Well, I couldn't play the heel, so I had to play with only three. And uh, uh, everyone thought that that was never going to work. And also, you couldn't. I couldn't put my right foot up on the swell pedal. Uh, I, if I put it there, I had to leave it there in order to make it louder and softer. And because if I tried to put it back down and pick it back up, I couldn't do it. And so my teacher said, "Well, it's more important to be able to make it louder and softer all the time, which is what we really want to hear, even in Bach, that uh, you should just put your foot up there and uh, just play with left foot." And the, they're left-footed organists. They're all jazz organists, really. I mean, you know, boom, 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 like that. Uh, so I, I did that. But then one day I heard, uh, one evening, I heard one of his students play a degree recital in which she played a Buxtehude, Prelude Fugue and Chacon, uh, and she didn't use the swell for it because he had... His teacher had her teacher had understood that uh, in the old days the organs didn't have that and you just played at the same level of dynamic all the way through. And I saw her doing that, and so I asked my teacher Wayne Fisher afterwards, 
well, Mr. Fisher, couldn't I play that piece and I could use both feet on the pedal keyboard? Well, I suppose you could, he said. So that began my love affair with Baroque music, mm -hmm. I think, right then. Mm -hmm. How did you ever get around a decent organ? Uh, well, I didn't for a long time. Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, I finished my degree, the Bachelor of Music and Piano, and I was signed up to do the Masters in Piano, and I asked if I could do a double major with organ. And my piano teacher said, yes, uh, if you're sure to practice enough for piano. So I started uh, doing a double major, and that meant four hours a day on each one, so that's not going to work, right? You don't have that. And she said, well, you will have to drop the organ. And I said, okay. But I came back the next day and said, Madam Conus, I'm going to drop the piano. Well, she, that's when she didn't like the organ. And she said, but the organ, it's not even a musical instrument. Honestly, she was right in the sense that we had never heard good organs yet. So in her way of understanding it, that was true. Uh, but somehow I knew that there were other organs that were going to sound better, and that I was tired of playing the piano and the piano repertoire from the 19th century. And mm -hmm. so I, I did go to become an organist. Mm -hmm. Crazy idea. So it was a crazy idea, right? Why would I want to do that? Uh, and I said once, well, I'm jumping ahead, but after I had met Barbara Conable, who was teaching me Alexander Technique, and I knew her pretty well, and I said, you know, I think giving up the piano and going to the organ might, might have looked like the worst thing I could do because I, I didn't have that enough ability in my right leg to do that. And she said, no, it was the best thing you could have done. I think you agree with that. Yeah, I do agree with that. I think you kept an incredible amount of function. You know, I, I did get to interview you once before. That was maybe right. about 15 years ago when you were playing the organ. And really, it was mm -hmm. an incredible... Uh, and, I, and I've also seen gone to see you at a couple performances. And it's an incredible amount of organization that you had uh, been yeah. able to keep through your whole system despite the challenges with your right leg. Right. And... and I didn't know that. Of course, I didn't uh, go on uh, and become a, uh, an organ major in order to keep better organization or better health and so mm -hmm. on. I, I did it because I loved the repertoire that I had already heard for the organ, and I had in my mind that there must be, I knew there must be organs that were more beautiful, and mm -hmm. I just had to learn how to play them, and then I had to find them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to be ready to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you don't always know if you're doing something for the right reason, uh, but, it, but it can help you. And it's, I know that it helped me um, and that I lived with better use of my legs and therefore my whole body mm -hmm. uh, with other help, uh, far better than if I had been more careful. Yeah, I agree. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Crazy. It's a twist and turn of life, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. I see it, if for me, I mean, this is of <laughs> course not accurate because I only know small dimensions of your life, but yeah. I do see this dance between your love of music and the organ and then the challenges of having had polio and how you know you are able to weave those back and forth throughout your life in a, in a way that's pleasing for you. Yes, and... Uh, after I finished the master's in organ, I had been encouraged by a music history professor at the College of Music who had since moved on to the Eastman School of Music to be an associate dean uh, to come to Eastman. Well, I didn't know that Eastman was one of the best, or maybe so we, after I went there, I thought the best uh, school for music in the country. Uh, and I just said, well, I don't think I can afford it. And he said, uh, you can be my grad assistant. And so I could go, and uh, I was accepted in an audition. 
and studied with David Craighead there, uh, who was really the next major influence in my life. And he understood uh, the problem that I had with polio. I, I mean, he, did, he knew it, but he didn't really understand it. It was mm -hmm. sort of a, well, possibly if you keep trying, you would be able to use your right foot. Uh, and I said, well, no, I won't be able to, uh, but uh, like you would want me to. But I, I think I can still do it. Look how I do this pedaling. And so I did some pedaling fancy stuff in pieces that he knew. And he said, oh, I can't even look. I can't look. It's making me dizzy because I'm using my left foot way high on the keyboard mm -hmm. instead of using my right foot like that. I, I'm crossing my left foot over the right and doing all these crazy things. And he said, I believe you now. I think, I think you can probably can do that. Uh, so he was on my side, right? Made him dizzy, I love that. <laughs> what? <laughs> made him dizzy, I love yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> he dizzy, they made him dizzy. Yeah. And, uh, that's, a fat, that's a fast footwork. Fancy yeah, that footwork. is a fast footwork. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think it made him dizzy because he was trying to see where my left foot had gone yeah. and see up over the other one. And what are you doing? Where is your right foot? And you know, so my legs are crossed and so on. And so it was kind of funny. I, well, I was used to it, to doing that. Of course, when I, later when I was teaching, um, I... If students want to borrow my score and look at my pedaling, I said, don't bother looking at my pedaling. You won't be able to do it. <laughs> it's too hard for you. <laughs> you would do normal pedaling. And then I would show, this is what normal pedaling would be. This is what you're doing. Not my crazy abnormal pedaling. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then, and... I, I felt very good about what I could do at, at Eastman, and I did take my time getting a doctorate degree. I spent several years there, and then finally finished it. And I lived in Syracuse, New York, for one year. I had a church job there in a Lutheran church, and I uh, took the opportunity. I didn't have a, there was not a full-time job, so I took a, a, a kind of a a clerical type job at the university answering phones and so on. They didn't have any other DMA students there answering their telephones, I'm sure. But I wanted the money. And I met then the uh, organ teacher at Syracuse University whose name was Arthur Poister. And he was had studied in France uh, when he was younger and, was, and in Germany. And he told me about organs that he had heard there. And I thought, this is fascinating. This man really knows a lot. He knows things that I would like to know. And so I asked if I could, in the summer, come and study with him. Yes, absolutely. So I studied for two summers with him. And he was the first uh, organ teacher that I chose for myself after you go to a school, you study with the organ teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky with the teachers I had in schools. David Craig had taught me how to be a real professional and my, raised my sights much higher. I remember saying to him one time, a third lesson on a piece, and I'd say, well, this piece is finished now, probably, and you give me another piece. This piece is not finished, he said. I said, it isn't? Why not? And he was always very kind, and he said, well, when do you stop missing all those notes? I didn't know I was missing all those notes. I thought I missed a few notes, maybe. But he thought there were too many. And I suddenly had my eyes opened, mm -hmm. right? My previous teacher had not been so upset about a lot of wrong notes. He thought it was more exciting. Uh, can she actually, can we, any of us? He missed a lot of the notes too. Uh, we want to play fast and loud, right? Mm -hmm. Faster and louder is better. Fastest and loudest is best, yes? A few notes here, a few notes there. Uh, and I'm not after perfection these days, but I don't think a few notes here and a few notes there is a good idea uh, either. And David Craig had didn't. So I, I got that from him. So he gave me a B in organ. I had never had a B in piano or organ in my life. That was a wake-up call. And the next semester, he gave me another B. And then, and he always gave me his music to copy the fingering out of, since so he thought that would help. 
And so it came to the end of that first year, and I said, okay, now I know what music I'm supposed to learn over the summer. Do I get to copy it? Give me your scores, I'll copy it. No, it's uh, you have to do it now. Ah, and I started getting A's. So, so I knew I had gotten somewhere. But I learned so much from his music, you see, so that's another way that students can learn, is that they can, at first, copy the teacher with the knowledge that pretty soon you're getting cut loose and you have to be yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little parroting is okay. Yeah. You know, to, 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 to mimic. It can teach you some, some kind of technique or it can teach you discipline. It can show you what this person that you admire, how they uh, edit their score uh, to make it something they can work from. Uh, and I think that that's uh, a skill that a lot of graduate students that I had to teach who came from another school didn't always have. Uh, they kind of just took a piece and just kept practicing it over and over and over until they got it. And they didn't write anything on it. The least bit of nervousness, it's gone. Mm. Uh, let it lie there for six months, you have to start over. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, I learned a lot from David. But then from Arthur Poister, I learned some of the traditions that he had learned in France from people uh, whose teacher actually knew César Franck, or from people whose teachers knew German composers whose music I was playing. And that was the first time I had run into anybody like that. Um, so after I was one year there and one year in Detroit playing another church job, I, I applied for and got a teaching job in Columbus, Ohio at Capital University. And if I'm dividing my life in, in two big halves, it's one is still being a student and one is starting to be a full-time teacher. But I qualify that by saying, I think I've never stopped being a student either because you and I know that uh, we never stop. <laughs> we never stop learning, at least we shouldn't be stopping learning. And we're always uh, uh, continuing to learn. That's, uh, not a, that's not a given, though. No, it I don't, isn't. I don't think it's a given, at least. Uh, I, 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 find it, I find that some people think that the accumulation of bits, facts, yeah. thing is learning, but I don't think it really is. I think that there's some there's something that you do and the way that you learn that's more about a deeper integration. Well, right. Uh, but I also I I mean the other I think any deeper integration that I've gotten has been in two big ways and or three. But one has been that I have sought out other teachers to work with after I was already teaching myself. And I, I've sought them out because I, I heard them play or I have heard about them and something about what I've read about them or listened to them on recording said to me, this person knows something that I don't know. Mm -hmm. This person has an admirable way of playing that I want to understand. This person knows a certain repertoire better than I do, and would they share that with me? And uh, uh, so, I, I, shall I give an example of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. After, uh, so we're going to skip the two years that I was teaching at Capital University in Columbus because not much really happened there. Uh, it was a full-time teaching job, and it gave me that credential that I would had a full-time teaching job. And so when it turned out that my own alma mater, CCM, now combined two schools, the College of Music and the Conservatory of Music, was going up to the UC campus and was opening a new building and needed another organ teacher to go along with the two that they had, my former teacher there, who was still on the faculty, thought of me. and. In those days, they didn't have the kind of formal search committees that they do now. And it was kind of, you had a recommendation from somebody, and then they let you come and talk to them. And if they liked 
your looks and thought you would be a good faculty member, uh, they might hire you and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, so anyway, I got the job. And I remember going in to interview with the dean, finally, whose name was Jack Watson, after whom Watson Hall is named. And he said, Roberta, would you like to come here and teach? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, well, we can offer you $9,000 a year. This was 1967. <laughs> and I, I said, ah, well, Capital University is offering me 11000 for next year, and that's just a little school. Oh, he goes, well, maybe you don't want to come here. My eyes are going, ah, and I said, I do. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Okay, good. Sign here. <laughs> you know, so I thought, well, maybe he was really just making that up and trying to save a little money. But uh, I wasn't going back to that Lutheran school up there. Not that I have anything against Lutherans. But I wanted to teach here, which I, I knew they would get good organs and things would be, life would be better here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> But you, give, you give up something to get something else. You give up else. something to get, get something else, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but the important thing that I remember from my first few years of teaching here at CCM was how I very quickly realized how upset I was getting with hearing and playing the music of Bach the way we were taught to play it. Uh, so, I understood and, and enjoyed the way that we were te taught to play 19th century romantic music, German and French, and what little American organ music I knew at that time. But uh, the music of Bach, which I, I dearly loved, there was something wrong with how I was playing it and how people around me were playing it and how recordings sounded, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I knew it had to do with rhythm, rhythm and accent, and it had to do with uh, touch in general. But I didn't know what it was, and, and the, the teachers on the faculty there, where I was teaching, didn't seem to know either. So I, I was at the point of determining that I would give up playing Baroque music for my wow. life. I thought, I know how to play Franck and Vidor and, and Rager, and so I can play all those. I like all those. Uh, I'm going to have to just give up Bach. I can't play it like this anymore. And I can't play the French classic music, the, the Couperin and uh, uh, early French music on the organ. It just doesn't sound right. There's something wrong. Fortunately, would you like to hear what happened? <laughs> uh, fortunately, there was an organ uh, tonal director from Casavant Organs came to CCM, and he was uh, going trying to sell us another organ, and it was going to be able to play, designed to play French classic organ music, which is would be 17th and 18th century. And I said, well, I hope we buy this, but I don't know anything about how to play that music. And he said, funny you should say that. I know a man, a French-Canadian, named Bernard Legacé, who teaches at, uh, in this country, in Connecticut, at summer workshops. And he is an authority in French classic music. You should just go there in the summer. And so I did. And I've, you've heard me speak of his name. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, the first player and teacher and personality who led me uh, towards um, the, the understanding of how uh, music in the 17th and 18th century was played and what the touch and articulation was for it and how the rhythm uh, was to, to be done. Um, I will never forget hearing him play the first time I can still remember it, a night in June of 1971. And um, I knew my life was changed, so he was 
immediately a big influence. Um, and it just sound it just must have sounded right to you. It there sounded some, right now. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is that instead of being you know you know that term legato, instead of being all, everything legato and connected, uh, with a very few exceptions, uh, it was was more open and vocal. I mean, if we were talking and we are uh, 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 everything's legato, you can't tell what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we we. You can tell what's going on because of consonants and because of small breaks in between mm -hmm. syllables that we're not really aware of. So that was what was not happening in Baroque music and needed to be happening. So I got started with that and I went then to Montreal to do a sabbatical study with him and it happened also that I met Tom there. Uh, what a coincidence! Mm -hmm. uh, he. Uh, was a grad student from Colorado who had gone also to study with Bernard Legacy, and we were the only two of Bernard's students who didn't speak French. <laughs> and so, oh, well, we had to talk to someone, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> works out. Right. So, uh, uh, nothing went on uh, untoward, but w after I went home and after he went home, he decided. Uh, he wanted to come for a doctorate somewhere, and he remembered that crazy woman that he met up in Montreal, and I guess she's probably a good enough teacher, and see if I can get into the CCM. And so he did, and he's never left. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. That's right. So is this the... This <laughs> <laughs> and yours and Tom, you and Tom both have a, a big love of continuing to try to understand what is the original way in which yeah. the music was played and, and experienced. Right. We will, of course, we know that we can never really know right. because players of the time would write little uh, hints about how to play things so, and theorists would, would talk about how we play here in Paris as opposed to how they play down in the provinces. Uh, but they would never be too specific. Uh, but there were uh, there were what we would call something like music boxes uh, and prepared, uh, pinned, and to make sound uh, the sounds of an organ like they were playing. And if you listen to it, you could hear that it was not legato at all. And it had all kinds of accents, it had all kinds of little tiny spaces that had to be set up to play that. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first ways that the people studying old French music started to figure out how they played. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, most of us who, as Bernard used to put it, became enlightened, as, which is not a f nice term to be saying. Some people are enlightened and some are not, but that's the way it was. And uh, some of us went first to the French repertoire to figure it out because it was easier to figure out there. And then we figured out that it was in Bach to, and not we, but a group of groups of people were beginning to get it. And so ever since about 1973 or four or so, uh, we've been, many of us have been experiencing that kind of development that starts with a different touch and then goes in all directions as far as rhythmic freedom and expressivity. And it also involves getting to know the historic organs. Mm -hmm. um, now, Historic organs in this country means uh, something in the mid 19th century, but historic organs in Germany uh, means as far back as 16th century. Even one might be the 15th, but surely the 16th and 17th. And so uh, that's one of the perks of uh, university teaching is that every however many years, usually seven, but uh, can be more or fewer you get some paid time off and, and you can go on a project like that. They do want you to have a project. They don't want you just to go home and watch TV. Uh, so you have to have something worthwhile to do. Well, so I went to Germany, Northwest Germany, where, as was explained to me by my mentor there, Harald Vogel, uh, the people were too poor to upgrade their, their pipe organs. And so the organs in northwest Germany in these little villages had remained basically the same, while as in the wealthier parts of Germany, they had, had completely upgraded and maybe ruined 
the old organs and left just the front pipes. And uh, so you couldn't tell had they had been at the beginning, mm. but you could tell in the little villages, and he knew all about this. And he gave us access to that, us meaning uh, those of us who came to study with him. It's really a great example of, uh, it's, it's just a great example of uh, somehow moving forward, but in the moving forward, you end up uh, obliterating, of yeah, course. The, that's you, right. You, you owe, I mean, it's always true, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's it maybe not always. When we'd like to think today that when people coming and upgrading organs or upgrading uh, a harpsichord or something, that they're 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 going towards the truth, uh, but that they often are not. They're mm -hmm. often going towards what their own style is from then, and and they're not going back. And then it it piggybacks because the next generation, which wants to look back to the very beginning is trying to, but they're running into what has happened in the meantime and thinking mm. that was the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And so they say, well, this is how they did it in the 16th century. No, it isn't. It's how they did it in the late 17th century. If you really want to get back there, you've got to find one that wasn't already messed up, something like that. So, so when did you start to get um, maybe more interested in your teaching stuff? Sort of like, to me, I'm hearing a lot about the accumulation of your own knowledge mm -hmm. up to this point and and how you can be a better organist and you can understand the, the, the technique and the musical expression that you want to have. Yes. But there's somewhere along the line where you started to get much more interested in your teaching, I think. Well, of course, we've left that part out because uh, I, I was, we were talking about how I was finding out these things. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, sometimes I would be finding out things, for example, from... Uh, we haven't mentioned yet Ed Parmentier, who is a harpsichord, was a harpsichord faculty member, but also played the organ at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And, and I had wanted to do some work with him at the organ, and he agreed to teach me the organ, even though I already played the organ. And he had the kinds of ideas I was looking for, which at first I, I was resistant to that. And I would tape, tape record our lessons and play it in a car on the way home from Ann Arbor. It's about, it's a four or five hour drive. And I would think, I don't know, that's, uh, it sounded before I was telling you, oh, this is what I wanted. But at first I didn't always know that it was what I wanted. And so I wasn't sure I would do that. But I started teaching it to my students anyway, just to see. Uh, that sounds like I'm, I'm doing something illegal, right? <laughs> I'm experimenting on my students with this, these basic things of non legato or little space here or don't play this so short, play this this way. How about doing some freedom here? And what I had thought I didn't like listening to on the tape recording, all of my students were doing it and I was thinking, yeah, that's, that's pretty good, that's good. And so they were starting to sound better than me, I thought. See, so that <laughs> wasn't seeming to be fair. And so, uh, so I started then doing it uh, too. And for a while, people would call it it. Do you do it? And uh, that stuff that she's teaching, uh, that articulation stuff and that uh, crazy stuff, do you do it? And they were buying t-shirts and saying, I do it. Do you do it? <laughs> it that sounds awful, really. Um, and we agreed we did all did it. And uh, so it was already a back and forth thing. And uh, these were, I didn't have any Asian students as yet. Uh, so these were all um, American students or Canadian students. Uh, English, their main language. Um, so I think... Uh, yes, I, I was concentrating on myself and how I was picking up this knowledge and how I was getting it and how much I wanted it. They didn't, they weren't looking for it, but I was their teacher, and so they got it anyway uh, through me. And the fact that they sounded better then, afterwards, made me realize, taught me, that this indeed was right. That I, old fogey, at maybe 45 by then or something, uh, or almost 48 or something, that, and here's these 20-year-old kids are suddenly starting to sound really good. So there was an interaction in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 
I also was trying to see that they could, uh, what, could, could be more aware of how music could affect them in their lives and uh, how music could change them internally instead of just being um, another skill that they were learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I often used to give a little uh, Zen saying to people, um, especially we, for two different kinds of students this was helpful. The student who was uptight because they were afraid that they couldn't do what uh, they would like to be able to do, and so they were so tense and nervous in the lesson that they couldn't play at all. Uh, and also uh, for the student who was afraid to ask anything and afraid to talk. Uh, so if you bring in something from um, these little calendars like uh, the classic uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with but a single step. And everybody has to, you have it on a little piece of paper, you say, here, read this and tell me about it. And say they read it. Yeah. And I say, no, no, what do you mean, yeah? Tell me what it means. Oh, well, it means, uh, well, I don't know how to say how it means. Think. You know, so they finally get something. and. Um, or they jump right in and they've got it, and so on. And then we talk about more about that. So every week, a different one. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, by that time, they were relaxed. And then they could play, see. And then next week, a different one, and so on. Uh, and I remember one time, uh, one of the Zen sayings had been by Yogi Berra, <laughs> baseball player. It was something like... Uh, standing out on the field and, well, I can't remember what it was, but uh, this was a Korean student. And I said, oh, uh, maybe, do you know who Yogi Berra was? Yes. Uh, he was a bear in the comic strip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, that's Yogi Bear. Oh. Totally, so, totally yeah, can understand yeah. how she got there, though. Yeah, yeah. right. She got there that way. Um, and... Then the funniest one was one of my favorite students, Korean students. Um, I was about to hand her the paper and she said, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, why? She was always so friendly and, and well, obedient, yes. And she was always saying, what do you mean you don't want to do it? I am tired of doing them. They all say the same thing. <laughs> and I said, you are right, they do. What is it that they say? They say, be there. Uh -huh. I thought, yeah, that is what they say. Mm -hmm. Good, but you still have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you still have to do it. So she got, oh, okay. Uh, but I gave her an award uh, for knowing that they all said the same thing yeah. in a different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she noticed. Yeah, she did notice. Mm -hmm. Wow. I always enjoyed you. Would you would bring in your Zen sayings to our sessions? I enjoyed it. Oh, did I do that? Yeah, yeah. I had forgotten that I did. That. Yeah, you, yes, you did. And you never let me off the hook off of just about anything like that. So. What do you mean? I, I don't remember that. You're not making that up, are you? I'm not, I'm not making that up. <laughs> I know. No, definitely not making that one up. It was good. It was lovely. So I can totally, I totally see how it would have added yeah. a, another important dimension to the student learning, where you can get so caught up in um, yeah. details, details, and almost a kind of um, one dimensionality of the the skill that you're learning yeah. if you're not careful. And right. of course, I mean, in the end, we all want to make quality connections yes. with each other. Right. We want to we want to matter in the world. We don't want to just right. clink out something. Right. I brought a couple of quotes I want to be sure to get in. And what the one that just reminded me of this one. Uh, when one teaches to learn. And so I thought, what? Oh yeah. That would have been a good one for the students because it's short. So when you're teaching, you you I'm teaching, I learn and they learn. If, if both doesn't happen, it's not real. If only 
I learn, the student doesn't get anything. If only she or he learns, I don't get anything, except, oh well, another student, uh, just bring the next one in, and, and so on. But I, I know, at Russell Saunders, who was a teacher at Eastman School of Music after I left, but whom I met later and we taught together in the summers in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And he used to say, Roberta, we're the lucky people. We get to teach all day long, all kinds of people, all kinds of students. Think how lucky we are. We get to learn from all of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, yes, we certainly do. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, another one that he said that, that I liked so much was uh, because he was giving me a compliment. And we had observed each other teaching in a summer workshop. And he said, well, Roberta, you and I teach the same way. I, we do? Yes. We take the student where they are and we move them one step forward. And then I volunteered after I thought about it. The trick is finding out where they are, mm -hmm. right? Because they're hiding that <laughs> often. Mm -hmm. They're hiding where they are. And you've got to get there because it's too easy to, to skip all the, the where they really are and to go here mm -hmm. and try to get that. You, know, you better make your mistake to go too low instead and, and get that and build on it. That's nice. That's, ni that's nice even for, not even for it, that's nice I, I, in terms of a somatic approach. We often think about what yeah. is that earlier developmental aspect? What's something way down underneath, underlying yeah. that, that would support this higher function that they're, they're right. trying to do and that it appears they do okay? But they'll yeah. never get, they'll but never be able to get past okay. Yeah, there's something else, yeah. right? And that's uh, I'm not saying that one can always find that, uh, but it's important to try to get it. And sometimes it's just lurking there somewhere. Uh, and if I, I like to keep my eyes on the students while they're playing, uh, I also like to follow the score. But I so usually have the score. But uh, I, I feel that I learn much more about how to teach them uh, if I can sit where I can see them from the side and can, can get their whole uh, posture and, and what they're doing and, and even facial expressions and for sure what's happening with the whole mechanism instead of being behind them. Uh, well, you began to incorporate much more of a somatic approach somewhere along the line. Can you, and I think of you as one of the early adopters for that because um, certainly at the time that uh, I was becoming a practitioner, when I would have the opportunity to work with musicians, I was not hearing that musicians were really aware yeah. of how their body, their movement, their sensation right. could be used to their advantage. Right, and uh, I, so that brings me to my meeting with Barbara Conable, who was an Alexander Technique teacher. And did you, did you ever meet her? I did not. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I met her uh, because she um, had been, she lived in Columbus, Ohio at the time, she and her husband. Her husband was on the, uh, was a cellist and taught cello at Ohio State University. <clears throat> and she was doing the Alexander Technique. And uh, she knew a lot of musicians. She was not herself a musician. Uh, she was hired by CCM to come there to teach movement, movement in acting, I think the course was called, and uh, because CCM had a theater arts division. And so she was down here one time, one day a week, and I saw her name and her and description of her background in the, the bulletin there. And by that time, I was also reading about something called post-polio syndrome, and I was thinking, uh-oh, uh, this would not be good. And I was not feeling any problems, but uh, I thought that may, could be ahead of me and might be a good idea to find out something about Alexander Technique. So I contacted her and asked if she'd be willing to meet and maybe give me a trial lesson and that we could do that. And she said yes. So the next time she came, she uh, came over to our part of the building and uh, uh, came and asked me to play the organ for her. And uh, 
one of the things that she that I was first surprised about was I had read something about Alexander Technique and, and what they generally how they generally begin you it, and I when I later went to a workshop in Alexander Technique not just with her uh, I went through the classic thing of you sit in a chair, you bend over, you tie your shoelace, you untie your shoelace, you bend, sit up, you tie it, and so on. So you do the classic approach of a certain number of exercises, all of which are good. But she were, she called it working in, in, in your activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and my activity was playing the organ. So she said, let's go in there and play for me. So I played for her. She watched and walked around the room and watched, and then she came up and said, there are many things you do well, and she started talking about my arms and wrists, which Madame Conus had taught me back in the old piano days. And she said, but there are many things I could help you with. And one of them is uh, you hold your, arm, your upper arms too close to your body. And she stood behind me and put her hands in. And she said, now, this is, armpit is not a nice word particularly to say, but I've got my hands in your armpits, and I don't want to feel you pressing on my hands. And I thought, what is going on here? <laughs> and so, who is this woman? Who's got her hands <laughs> in my so, armpits? <laughs> she, so I... I, I thought, well, okay, she said, do that. So I, I go out like this, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> I'm going to fall over. <laughs> you know, I'm going to fall over, but it, it feels good. I wouldn't mind. And uh, so that was when I signed up. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's make a deal. Uh, how much per hour, <laughs> and how much uh, can we do it? Can we work together? And uh, she said yes. And so she would do, a, do the lessons down here, or and then eventually we, and Tom got interested and wanted to play for her because he was having trouble with his hands, not having studied with Madame Conus. And uh, so I remember that she took him into a room across from my office, and he played something, and he reported that later she said, we've got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> So she was right out front with it, mm -hmm. and he liked that too. And and so we would drive up to Columbus and yeah. uh, have lessons up there. And you eventually, <clears throat> excuse me, wrote a chapter for a book for her with her, right? It, yes. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't with her, but she uh, inspired the book. Okay. Uh, Thomas Mark wrote the book, but oh, that's in, right. in collaboration with her ideas. It was called What Every. It ended up being called What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body. And he, he said, he really wanted to say uh, what every player of a musical instrument wants, <laughs> or of a keyboard, but, and we tried to get organ in there, but no. But it says in the preface, it's for pianists, organists, harpsichordists, keyboardists, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. And uh, yes, he, uh, with her benefit, uh, her blessing, asked us to write the chapter on uh, special things for organists, meaning mm -hmm. what do you do with your hip joints and your legs and, and so on. And uh, also we could write addenda in each chapter, uh, like this is especially good for, in the, in the middle of the chapter, not just pianists but organists because, mm -hmm. or organists need to be careful because, and one of the big reasons is they can't balance on the floor with their feet. All right, so you really have to know where your hip joints are, mm -hmm. and you really have to know not to sit on your tailbone, mm -hmm. like I've been doing right here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you really have to get on, on to your, uh, your uh, she called them your, your rockers, uh, mm -hmm. onto your sit bones, and, and be able to do that. Yeah, I, I, noticed, I noticed that our desire to see each other here in this yeah, we're setup, that we're, we're set up, for, yeah, it's not the best of uh, a yeah, never best the postural. But. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I suspect, as far as I know, that I, I'm the first organ teacher that I knew of, but I didn't know all the organ teachers, uh, that was truly into uh, something like Alexander Technique or Feldenkrais, and <clears throat> was trying to apply it to students, not just to themselves. And um, it has been very helpful to lots of my students. Some of them 
just gave lip service and really weren't interested, that's fine. But maybe they learned a little bit about it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think about the, the time. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think you and I have ever had this discussion, but I, when people would come to me, usually professors from uh, CCM, uh -huh. um, there was a lot of quietness about them needing help. People were very concerned about other people ever knowing about it. Yeah. It was difficult to ever right. build any kind of, you're the only person who referred anyone to me, really, because you were willing to say, hey, you know, this is a good thing. I use it. Why right. not use it? Uh, right. The others were, were concerned about saying that because they didn't want anyone to know they were struggling. Right. So, and that was, so that was, you know, in the, um, that was in the 90s. Uh, that, that was still happening. So uh, that's, you know. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. And um, uh, when Barbara occasionally would uh, come and she would give a uh, class, mostly for my students, but I would make it open to the piano students. And some of the piano faculty would, re would refuse to let their students come. Mm -hmm. And uh, would, would say even to me that I shouldn't invite their students. And well, I said, and the faculty can come, the piano faculty. I wouldn't step foot in that room, somebody says. And what? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want that anyone messing with my students' technique, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, which is the technique I taught them, and they may be suffering, but so what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't think that exists now. Um, uh, it's I think changed that, a lot. that mm -hmm. the faculty, um, I know in particular the voice faculty now, is very open uh, to for their students to know more about the body. Mm -hmm. Hmm, surprise. And, and about how we talk and how, mm -hmm. what the lung, how the lungs really work and all kinds mm -hmm. of things like that. And um, so I think it's, it's a new day. But yeah, uh, people looked at me like I was crazy a lot of the time. I, maybe I was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but crazy in a good way. Um, I was also, going to include, I wanted to say that, uh, and you will remember this too, that uh, though I was always, I thought, in pretty good health after the polio, um, that I, I did uh, fall a couple of times in consecutive years and break a bunch of bones, as we call it. So in 2009, I slipped and fell at, at CCM and broke the right tibia fibula. And <clears throat> it's always on the right side because that's where I have the poorest balance. And uh, I recovered from that, but uh, almost a year to the day after that, I again fell and broke the hip joint on this side and the, right up at the where the humerus meets the scapula. Um, and that was, was really hard, mm -hmm. uh, to have them together, being, this being partially replaced, and this arm being in a sling because they didn't want to do surgery. So that was really hard. Uh, <clears throat> and I think if I had not known uh, the amount, and it wasn't all that much, about how the body worked and how to compensate, and how to recover, and I did have good surgeons, course at Christ Hospital and I had good rehab and I had a good husband helping out um, I don't think I would have come back from that yeah um, I think that's probably true you, you yeah. it, was, it was a biggie right really a big one it was big mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so uh, the skill that you you know that you originally sought out to try to keep from having the effects of post polio then you find out Oh, hey, it turns out that it actually helps me with my playing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we didn't talk a lot about this, but I think that you would say it helps you with not just, not just, the, not just using your body better, but it helps with the actual uh, listener experience. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps, it helps everything because it helps, it gives you new eyes for other people. And it gives you new ears for other. It gives you a new sense of, of if you you can't possibly be thinking about how your own body moves and not be sometimes noticing how somebody else does, mm -hmm. and especially if you're teaching and and you're wanting all the time to uh, 
analyze, if we want to call it that, analyze uh, what's wrong with this person <laughs> uh, or what is good about this person mm -hmm. uh, that I, I might learn about and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, or how could I suggest without insulting this person that they might do this, they might think about that. Um, so more and more, okay, but then when I, I, after I retired, so in 2013 in August, I retired from full-time teaching. And by that time, uh, so I was 80. And, uh, you know, it's time to relax a bit. But uh, that's pretty boring, just to relax. And, and for all the Alexander and all the Feldenkrais, uh, this leg is not going to get better. Uh, that's not going to happen, as I told David Craighead at Eastman when I was uh, 25. <laughs> it's not going to happen, but it served me well. And so I really couldn't play using an organ using this leg anymore. So there's still a repertoire you can play with no pedal or some that you can play with just the left foot. But I had always been fascinated by the harpsichord and never really had time, much time for it. I would go to workshops in the summer, and then we had this harpsichord, the solo, and uh, I would come back and play, and oh, I don't know, it didn't sound the same as the ones I heard uh, at Parmentier play up in Ann Arbor, and it just wasn't right, and so well, maybe we should sell that harpsichord and get a, a better one. But a friend told me about uh, former harpsichord builder who now was retrofitting harpsichords according to historical principles that he had discovered to make them sound like what he was pretty convinced they would have sounded like in the old days. And he was convinced uh, by that from the fact of how uh, real historic instruments sounded and what we knew about historic singing uh, from vocal treatises from the period and that the harpsichord would not have been the little tinny thing uh, that most of us were experiencing uh, then. And his name is Paul Irvin, and he lives in Portland, Oregon, and he has been here in this, in our condo this week, working on both of the harpsichords. Um, the one harpsichord, uh, the Sutherland, he had worked on, has worked on for several years off and on, and it is better every time. And the new one, which uh, we have now, which is uh, built by William Hyman in 1978, uh, was his, he had retrofitted it already for us uh, out in Oregon and had been shipped here. And so he was working on that some more. And uh, I get to play that for you today. Yes, yes, what are you gonna be playing for us? Well, uh, first I'll mention again the name of the harpsichord and so, and the builder. Uh, David Sutherland, who lives uh, still in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, built the, the one harpsichord. Uh, it's in more or less Italian design, uh, which means it has to do with the shape of it and the kind of wood in it and the kind of sound that we thought Italian was supposed to be, which may or may not be the kind it really is. And uh, on that harpsichord, I'm going to play the Bach prelude in D major, from the Well-Tempered Clavier, book two. And it's a piece which uh, sounds like trumpets, uh, drums and trumpets, it's very joyful. And then, on, then we have the harpsichord built by William Hyman in 1978, a, a well-respected builder who died quite young. And uh, so his harpsichords are kind of scarce uh, to, to find but we decided a couple of years ago we needed another one down here. And so it's a different style. It's what's called a French harpsichord, uh, which means it's a different kind of wire in it and, and it has a, a more mellow sound to it. Um, and it uh, has more resonance in, in a sense. It's uh, somewhat better on music that's not fugues and, and really contrapuntal. And I'm going to play the Bach prelude in E flat major, uh, which is described by some as uh, a, a piece 
which gives you peace of mind, P-E-A-C-E, -E, not I will give you a peace of my mind, but I will give, give you, I never thought of that before, I will give you <laughs> peace of mind. And it is, I, I always feel very peaceful and calm after playing it. And then I will, will, after that, close, still at the French double harpsichord, with a piece by Chambonier, uh, whose actual full name was, let me see if I get this, uh, Jacques Champion de Chambonnier. They called him Jacques for short, probably. <laughs> and I don't know what they called him. And it's a Chaconne in F major. And the, the wonderful thing about this piece is it's a ex good example of a refrain with verses. So it begins with the, the full sound of the harpsichords, three different stops, eight, eight, and four combined. And then you play this refrain part, and then you go to the other keyboard, and you play just on one eight-foot sound, and a different different piece of music. And then you come back to the couple of keyboards, and you play again the refrain, and you do that about five times. And so you always recognize every other part, but in between parts, you hear fancy little ornaments and so on, and it's everybody loves it, and I love it, and I always feel elated and expanded after I play it. Wonderful. We look forward to hearing that. So what we're going to do is make a transition and Roberta's going to take us out with those three pieces. And I think you'll, I, mean, I know I'm looking forward to it. Well, I am too and I love the music and I, I feel sure that you will love it too and that you will like both of our harpsichords with, and, uh, as we do. Yeah. Thank you for having me here, Cynthia. Thank you for agreeing to do it and um, inviting me into your home. I appreciate it. And thank you all. So you are really on the very last day of our summit, our time together. And I, I'm sure you've had an enjoyable time uh, with us and that um, you'll be able to watch this again tomorrow on Encore Day. So, if, you know, this one, others, other talks, you'll be able to pick up tomorrow as well get to see them all over again. So it's been a great time Thanks. and I love wrapping up the summit with you. Thank you. I'm glad that you did that and that we did that. That we did that, <laughs> yes. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>